taxes are the worst possible form of government funding. Bitcoin will enhance our individual freedom. Much more important than what you can vote on in a democracy is what you're not allowed to vote on. As soon as they turn to taxes, it didn't take long until they turned totalitarian and ultimately collapsed. Taxes and democracy are not compatible. As soon as you start taxing in, in a couple of decades, maximum a few centuries, you lose the democracy. What will Bitcoin do to our society, to our political system, to um, uh, like you wrote to Bitcoin nations and it's uh, kind of like of this topic and asked often like what what will happen when once we have adopted a Bitcoin standard, um, like what do you think will happen? Well, I think what will happen is beyond our imagination. I think... Um, as people 100 years ago couldn't imagine the technology of today, I think we cannot imagine the society in 100 years, but there are historical hints, right? So um, in general, what I say is that essentially money is the foundation of uh, society. And if you build a, a society on a, on a weak money, the same thing happen, happens that happened to the Tower of Pisa, right? It, it leans over, it leans over, and at some point it falls. And um, if you build on hard money, um, everything in a society changes because essentially we don't think of money so often uh, as we don't think about air that we breathe, right? It's so fundamental to every human interaction outside of the family um, that we, we don't even notice how much um, money influences us. I mean, uh, you know, Saifedean in the Bitcoin standard or many Bitcoin, say, oh, Bitcoin fixes this to, to everything. And really what I tried in Bitcoin Nation uh, to, to um, formulate as, as, as arguments is that essentially it is true, right? There's, there's only two kinds of major problems in our society, problems that Bitcoin fixes and problem that you can fix only on a Bitcoin standard. So it's not like everything is automatically fixed, but I don't think we can fix any of the fundamental problems in our society without adopting a hard money first. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, let's take one step back. Uh, why do you um, like what inspired you to write this book in the first place? I mean, a little bit about myself. I'm originally an electrical engineer. And after engineering school, I wanted to go deeper into economics because I've been always interested in philosophy and economics. And these two are very intricately connected, even if you don't think so, maybe. Um, and then I basically, I, I went to some uh, MBA um, um, lectures at the university and with the engineering mindset, it's always about thinking through how things actually work. I was sitting in these first two or three lectures and I was like, that guy is talking complete nonsense, right? That that, that cannot be true. So yeah, I, 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 I uh, then unenrolled again from the <laughs> MBA. And, and did my own study and I very quickly came up with, upon Austrian economics, but also um, the writings of Argentarius. And um, Argentarius was a um, German banker and basically his um, uh, name was Alfred Landsberg and he was writing as Argentarius. And he was basically explaining in 1921 that a hyperinflation would be coming in, in, in Germany and then wrote all throughout 1922, 23, explaining what was happening. And the crazy thing for me was when I read uh, his books, that basically his, his letters could have been written today. Our politicians are using the same arguments, are making the exact same mistakes as they did back uh, in, in, in Weimar Germany. And yeah, then I basically translated his books into English because I thought, yeah, Right now, the world is on a dollar standard, so the, the English speakers need to know uh, um, uh, about this. And, and that was what really kicked me then deeply into the rabbit hole. I started then getting in, in, involved more and more in the Bitcoin space. I started working uh, on the first open source projects. I then, based on that, developed um, this Lightning POS uh, device that we launched with Opago as a product, actually. And yeah, I, I started thinking more and more about this. but. Um, while Saifedean in his Bitcoin standard was already very bullish on how um, society will change on a, on a Bitcoin standard, one argument that I was really missing is how Bitcoin will change our governance, really how, how uh, states, how nations, how, how human societies, organization will change on Bitcoin. And um, 
back then I was thinking about maybe the internet makes states as they are today obsolete. And I was very happy then when I was discussing these arguments and, and writing about them um, for the first time that I heard that just a few months before um, somebody pointed out to me that Balaji had published uh, the network state. And I was like, really? Yeah, cool. And then I read it and was kind of disappointed because on the one hand he says, yeah, the internet changes everything. We can organize our society uh, differently. And we do that, build a digital decentralized nation, and then we just um, turn it into a free private city. <laughs> that for me was like, I agree with the first step, but why is the second step necessary? And, and the thinking about this is essentially what I wrote down uh, and, and published as Bitcoin Nation, or rather the condensed version, because actually I, I spend much more time shortening the book uh, than writing it, because I was so impressed by Agentarius, who always really on point uh, explain things like his book Das Kapital so basically is <laughs> homage to Marx where he debunks both Adam Smith and Marx and explains his own capital theory in like 89 pages mm. and uh, I wanted to to have the same kind of conciseness I, I didn't quite manage it it turned out to be 150 pages long but but in the end uh, I, I really tried to have a condensed argument why why is bitcoin important for society and how w what possibilities do we have with bitcoin i mean i i refrain from going too much into detail because as i said i think that um once really a, a market process is kicked off and once there's a real competition between state services providers um i think the same will happen that happened with the industrial revolution and 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 people will come up with solutions that we cannot even imagine today yeah, I think it's also um, like when when always when we think of what Bitcoin can do for the future, um, we only know it directionally, like the, the details and the, what actually will happen. It's kind of hard to, to see. But for me, it's like Bitcoin will enhance our individual freedom. And this is also what you wrote on the book like with, with like, yeah, kind of the digital citizenships. Um, how you can imagine Bitcoin making the the world a little bit freer. Um, what I, what I, one specific question I have: uh, How do you see taxes? <laughs> how do you see um, taxes on on a Bitcoin standard? Uh, is there any difference on on that topic? I think taxes are the worst possible form of government funding. And um, historically, if I, if you look at history, I think I mean the tax system we have today comes. Comp completely out of the feudal system, right? It's almost one-to-one. -one. And um, if you look at democracies before ours, like Greece or Rome, especially Greece is very clear. You see that basically um, they were quite peaceful, right? They were mostly defensive and they were even able to fend off the, the giant Persian empire completely without having uh, taxes, just with volunt a voluntary system of of uh, funding of government. But as soon as they turned to taxes, which they needed to do because now they wanted to attack back and try to conquer, try to plunder, it, it, it didn't take long until they turned uh, totalitarian and ultimately collapsed. And the same thing happened in Rome, right? Rome is a little bit different because they always had a kind of a tax system. But as soon as they really... Um, turned on the universal tax system um, and started really taxing income. As soon as that happened, it took a few decades until there was an empire and then basically money printing started. Uh, and, and I mean, they, they lasted relatively long, longer than all other examples that I could find. But even then, basically, it was the marker of the beginning of the end. So for, from, from, my, from my perspective, really, taxes and democracy are not compatible. As soon as it starts, taxing in in a couple of decades maximum a few centuries uh, you you lose the democracy it's a fascinating view um and when when we learn about bitcoin it's always interesting what hurdles we have to overcome and you're an engineer and you write also from an engineering uh, uh perspective and I meet a lot of engineers or like software developers or other engineers um that 
have a hard time understanding Bitcoin because they focus on like one aspect and they want to improve it, their scalability and stuff like that. Um, but in general, I think every engineer who gets uh, uh, the, the sound money aspects should get Bitcoin too. Um, did you was it was it helpful for you to have this engineering mindset, or you touched on it in the beginning a little bit, uh, or did it was it in your way? On one hand, it's helpful. I would even say I, th I think every university degree should have a basic engineering course in the beginning because what you learn in engineering school is really how to think a problem to how to understand why something why a machine works or doesn't work and that's a universal principle like how 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 all this works on a first principles basis that you can apply to everything else and one of the big issues in fields like economics is that the people in the field do not have this background and essentially they just get lost in some kind of meta discussions where every engineer that hears it says immediately that's just plain wrong If you if you look at it from first principles, it's just wrong. There's no no debate about it. Um, but on the other hand, I think money, as I said, is so fundamental that you really you need to be a universal genius, a classic Greek philosopher warrior type to really grasp it. Which is why I don't even uh, think I understand it fully on all in, its implications. But in general, I noticed that to really understand Bitcoin, to really fall into the rabbit hole, you always need two. Uh, scientific fields. For me, it was engineering and economics. I got first into touch with Bitcoin when I was um, working at Roden Schwarz and I was there in the basically in the military communication security or communications surveillance uh, technology department. And most of my colleagues were like in the Chaos Computer Club, these, these um, left wing hacker types. And they brought me into contact with, I think, 2011 or 2012 for the first time. And these were times when you just sent around hundreds Bitcoin for testing purposes, right? Um, but I didn't keep any. I didn't really understand it because it was the same arrogance. Yeah, this is nice idea, but not scalable, too slow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the hardest point for any software developer and engineer to understand Bitcoin is that there's really one counterintuitive fact about it. Because every technology in the world You want to innovate, you want to build, you want to iterate, you want to try and error. Money is exactly the other way around. You want to be really slow, really careful. And, and if it works, don't touch it. Go to a higher level, layer, but don't touch the base layer because it's, it, it's, it's the foundation, right? And, and what many engineers don't understand is that tinkering in Bitcoin's uh, layer one is like... Uh, saying, yeah, um, this skyscraper, I like it. I want to add 10 more floors on top. and But now I experiment with, with the foundation, right? Now I, I, I drill holes into the foundation and inject some plastics to test if that plastic is better than concrete. But the risk is always that if you make an error there, the, the whole thing topples over. And with the money, it's like with a building, right? You, you might think, okay, now it, it works. But 50 years later, you, you might see the cracks. And, and, and that's the same with Bitcoin. I mean, Taproot was, from my perspective, the last really necessary soft fork. So we needed Taproot to be able to get Bitcoin to, uh, with the second layers, to eight or even 10 billion people. Now I think we have everything in place in layer one to, 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 to scale to, to every human. So I'm my default position on any soft or hard fork is no, <laughs> unless a bug is discovered or, or whatever. And, um, Even with Taproot, it was definitely necessary. It was very, very well checked by some of the most brilliant software engineers in the world. And what happened? It unintentionally brought us ordinals and this this uh, main layer spam. So you you can never be sure. And, and even if you say it's just a small update, I think that the, the if at all you should do, unless it's a bug fix again, big soft forks really. Think through what do we need and, and treat every update like it's the last update. Not like, okay, we do this update and then, then we do that update. Because the, the smallest ones are, are the most dangerous. Because essentially, um, one small bug in a single, simple, um, innocent change might bring the whole thing down. And you have this outsized risk, right? You have a very small improvement, but the risk is you could destroy the whole system. <laughs> This is uh, and and this is what 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 is exactly against the nature of all uh, engineers and software developers that 
always want to iterate, 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 iterate. Yeah, every two weeks a sprint meeting and iterating over all the all the small things and changing that. Um, is it comparable? Like I often make this uh, comparison uh, with the TCP/IP protocol and Bitcoin as the base layer. Is that a fair comparison? Somewhat. I mean, TCP/IP is definitely not the best possible protocol for the internet, but it's just a standard has so great networks effect. And yes, if you switch the protocol, there's a there's a gigantic risk that you split the internet and have have interoperability issues i think as as crazy as it might sound bitcoin is much more important than the internet so <laughs> and and bitcoin would work without the internet but um the internet does not really work for society without bitcoin as we can see by by all the problems we, we're seeing arising currently right the internet is a great technology but as you can see in a fiat standard it has also has quite many downsides of the interplay of this global communication, this global um, interconnected society, but the society not being able to really um, interact. Because what, what what most people don't get about what happens when a money is inflated is essentially um, whenever these new monetary units are added, essentially the, the person who adds these units overrules all the decisions, all the purchase contracts, all the work contracts that are out there, right? It's like 8 billion people decide this is right for me. This is right for you. We agree. We do this deal. But then some central bank comes in and says, no, we just change the terms of your deal unilaterally. And basically, let's say if you, if you, if you make a deal, let's say you, you want to buy an iPhone and the iPhone costs a thousand euros and you negotiate, you get it for 900. Okay. You saved 100 and the merchant got 100 less same if the merchant rips you off and you accidentally pay 1100 so in sum whenever you do a voluntary deal the purchasing power of both parties stays the same and the purchasing power in the whole economy stays the same unless the efficiency of the economy improves that's different with fiat money that if you in the moment where you shake hands somebody doubles the money supply essentially it doesn't manifest directly but essentially what happens in that moment both of your purchasing powers have been halved right you did that deal but in some you're both suddenly have half the, the purchasing power so that's 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 the evil thing about money printing that you're offsetting the um well thought out decisions of all eight to ten billion people uh out there right now, now at eight but i always think about but happens in the future, right? We will probably max out the 10 are the current calculations and, and you overrule all these people. And the, the funny thing is when people say, yeah, but with AI, then central planning will work. It's just also nonsensical because basically if the AI knew the subjective value judgments of all people and um, understood what all people want and need at any time, it still couldn't plan better than all 8 billion people doing their decision. It would be just be a very gigantic, energy-hungry uh, machine that does exactly nothing else than what is already happening in the, in the market exchange. It's, uh, this just came up in my mind uh, um, about central planning and AI. Um, for me, Bitcoin is a force against against central planning and this kind of uh, communism uh, worldview is Bitcoin kind of forcing capitalism onto the world, forcing for me now in a positive sense, but uh, yeah, forcing to it. I mean, the, the word capitalism is really, um, has a lot of ballast going on, right? So I would really say free market exchange because capitalism, everybody understands something different uh, with it, right? Just talk to a libertarian. He will tell you what we have right now is not capitalism. Yeah. And um, talk to a, a socialist or communist. He will tell you what we have is communism is, is capitalism but the funny thing is they both agree because both see the same problems just the one say the problem i, I label the problem socialism and the others label the problem um, capitalism but in the end the problem is always that some handful of people is interfering with um, the voluntary uh, cooperation of others 
for me, it's also fascinating because capitalism in an end, uh, like you need free capital. So uh, when, when there's a central bank in the, in the country, there, that just cannot be capitalism for, for me. But uh, yeah, there are people that say, oh, it's capitalism. It's it's wrong. We should not have it. Um, in, in the broader sense, when we go now to this um, Bitcoin standard, to this Bitcoin nation model uh, in the long run, like I think it will be a, a longer kind of a transition. Um, and I always think of the consequences this trans transition can have if people don't get it and they are then really late to the transition. They might be angry. They might uh, go to the streets. Like it's so easy for people now to, to go to the streets and protest against something. Um, how do you think this trans transition uh, could be? Can it can it be peaceful? Like I hope for it, a peaceful revolution to Bitcoin, but can or will it be peaceful? <laughs> That's hard to say. That depends not so much on Bitcoin, but rather on the other side. I mean, right now we see this push for global totalitarianism. So all countries are really pushing more and more into your rights, into your freedoms. And um, I think there's two really big advantages that Bitcoin has. One is the, just the demographic bomb that really society is aging, less and less children are being born, especially in the Western countries. So um, there is quite fierce competition to be expected, especially in the next few decades uh, to get really um, the highly skilled workers and highly skilled workers are usually attracted by less taxes, more freedom. So whoever goes the, the freedom, the free market, the Bitcoin way has an advantage over those who go the totalitarian way. And that's, I think the key driver that will help, um, Bitcoin win, but it's definitely a race between uh, the freedom forces and, and uh, the totalitarian forces. But essentially, I think what Bitcoin will allow is actual democracy. I mean, anarcho-capitalists don't like that. They say, no, we want anarchy. We don't want democracy. But um, I think Andreas Thiel, um, Swiss comedian, formulated that much better than I could ever have. He ex essentially explained that democracy is the only known practical form of, of anarchy, right? He explains that there's really only three types of um, organizing a society. One is anarchy. Nobody's in charge. Then there's um, monarchy, right? One person is in charge. And then there's oligarchy. A handful of people are in charge. And um, the current democracies are much closer to oligarchy to, than to anarchy. And and but essentially, if you, if you go with this model, right? Um, Democracy is, is like really one type of anarchy. There's anomie, which is that what many people that are like opposed to anarchy um, expect anarchy to be, right? Just chaos, looting. But anomie is not really anarchy because anomie is completely unstable, right? It goes very quickly into warlord, mafia type structures, which are essentially uh, monarchy or oligopoly. So democracy is the only relatively stable form of that. One issue with democracy is that it tends to turn into a oligarchy and into a dictatorship of the masses. And the root cause of this is essentially that much more important than what you can vote on in a democracy is what you're not allowed to vote on, right? What are the unchangeable rights, the individual decision that um, the group of people is not allowed to vote on? Um, um, Anarcho-capitalists often joke that uh, like... Um, um, gang rape uh, has a 90% majority vote, right? <laughs> um, so really important in democracy is what are the unchangeable, unalienable rights? And there's an like a uh, Titus Gable model with free private cities. Okay, we just have 100% consensus, voluntarism. We can only change the code uh, if all people agree. But if you have a slight understanding of philosophy, logic, and history, you know that can't work, right? There's this big story in the in the Northern mythology about Baldur, the beautiful, nice god that everybody loved, but that got killed. And essentially, the goddess of, of uh, hell, Hel, agrees that she will let him back into the lands of the living if there is 100% consensus that he should return. And then the, the trickster god Loki, um, disguised as an old woman, is the one who says, no, I don't want it. And he's not brought back to life. And I think that's for almost every decision, right? There is always 
one person that is against it. And if it's just because of, they just want to destroy it, right? So full voluntarism cannot work. And then where, where do you put the bar, right? This is 90%. This is 96%. Is it 100% consensus for some? 90%, 60%? The, the problem is how do you figure out what set of rules is the best one? And I think right now the issue is that what we've been trying with the Constitution is we just do one shot, right? This is the Constitution, and this should last for the next centuries, at least. We don't have this continuous iteration process with constitutions to get them better. And the reason is because we're afraid that they iterate to the worst, like we see right now happening, right? That gradually freedoms are... Uh, infringed upon and then at some point a dictator takes over like has happened so many times but i think the the remedy to that is not to just say okay this is this one constitution we need to protect that but i think really the the thing is you have to have a free market right people have to have the ability to just say okay i don't like this constitution anymore i want to switch but there then the issue is if it's territorially organized there's a really high bar for people to switch like for me i'd rather live in a dictatorship and fight underground against it than leave my hometown. <laughs> that's um, that's my issue and that's for the majority and this is for evolutionary reasons. That is on, only ever a small percentage of people that are willing to uh, to move to another country, let alone another continent. And the pressure has to be really, really high for that to happen. So um, the only way you can ever achieve a free market competition uh, for state services is if your state service provider is independent of your country. And I would really say before the internet, that was just not possible to organize a society that way. But now with the internet and with Bitcoin, it is possible from my perspective. And that that's really the the key driver that i think will happen um, basically the competition for workers will lead to states opening up services giving out digital citizenships offering service that they offer to people that are not living in their territory and over time i think just the the ter territorial monopoly will erode and at some point just disappear that's a fascinating concept uh, i but I, i have to dig deeper in the, into that for me it's just a really uh, foreign. Uh, I mean, I with the sovereign individual, the book, uh, it also goes in, in, in that direction, right? A little bit. A little bit, yeah. I mean, the sovereign individual is, I think, more in the direction that it will just states will completely disappear. I, I think, don't think that will happen. I think they will gradually morph into non territorial uh, entities. Uh, then it will be basically more private entities. I mean, I think the distinction of public and private does not really make sense, right? This mm. this public is usually just a label for it's public, so we force you to pay for it, right? I think it, it, it goes more into the direction that basically um, maybe there will still be one state services provider that provides jurisdiction, police, everything. Maybe it will be gradual, right? That you have maybe one provider for security, one provider for this, one provider for that. But in general, what will happen is I think this um, competition that just necessarily arises will force these service providers to provide better services, but basically to also um, get voluntary payment, right? To say, you get this from me if, if you choose me as your provider uh, and you have to pay X for it and not this model, right? Um, you have you just have to pay X and we decide whatever you get and what you get gets worse over time while what you have to pay gets gets increasingly higher like it is today. 21 Bitcoin is Bitcoin only from day one and they teach and preach self-custody. This is my go-to exchange when someone asks me, oh, where can I buy my Bitcoin from? This is the easiest entry for Bitcoiners. And if you want lower fees, plus at the same time support this podcast, use code ROBIN and click the link in the description. Uh, when we look back in the, in the history, is there anything that uh, compares really good to what's probably to come with Bitcoin is like with, with when there was a gold standard, when we were, were bartering with gold and silver coins, is that comparable to what we will imagine or will it be completely different? I mean, I think the Hanseatic uh, City League 
is the closest thing, right? What they had was these several free cities that in, in each city, they had their own law code. And the law code was more, mostly merchant law, right? Really, the merchants agreed upon the, the, the basic rules, how to resolve conflicts, how, how to, how to uh, trade. And then there was basically the, the code of the league, how we help each other if we're attacked. And I think this is this is more um, the model that likely will happen. And um, I mean, I think essentially free private cities are instable because they you can have only a small territorial entity if you're really free, because free people tend to be very, very, um, yeah, unique, right? Very individualist. So it's very hard to get large groups of, of um, freedom-minded people in one area to agree on the same code. And if you have one group of free people, they get rich very quickly and they generate um, animosity by the poorer, not so free people around them. And at some point, they just band together in a large enough group to just overrun the small group. So really what you need is like a, a global league of free private cities, counties. Um, but I think the starting with a free city or a free county is is um, the wrong order, right? Basically, you start from where we are. It gets more free. Maybe there is leagues that are independent for states, but say like we defend each other against infringement upon our rights. We maybe... Um, um, have a common lobby group that speaks in the at the United Nations or wherever for our interests, and and then later we federalize and have like um, regional groups that have their own rule set, and this goes also into I think the current um, the current system of governments has this federal concept because they know it's needed, but right now everything's more centralized, and quite honestly set up exactly the wrong way like for in, in germany for example our education system is federalized <laughs> each each of the each of the regions in germany decides on their own education but i say exactly education there needs to be as a, a maybe a certification on a nation level and then the free market should provide the education solutions where you can reach this certification level right this shouldn't be something that's decentralized at all, other than that you have competition uh, of the providers for the education. But the norms, really, how to charge an education level should has such strong network effect. This must be as centralized as possible. On the other hand, um, lots of regulations like building codes and stuff, um, these are centralized, which makes no sense because they don't, in, in my perspective, they shouldn't be regulated by the government at all because in the end you're responsible for your own building if it collapses on your head or on the heads of your tenants and secondly your neighbors have to be uh, in line with if you basically build a huge building they cannot see the uh, the landscape anymore or whatever but that's that's really um, voluntarist low, very very local uh, decision making scheme but it's completely centralized so we have a lot of this backwards and I think the only way to figure out what is the right level, what should be on which federal federal level or completely free market without any central player, this is not something one person can just say, this is right. This is something that really has to be trialed and errored and, and developed over time. Uh, definitely. But for me, it, it's, uh, it seems dangerous if, the, uh, if a nation level is saying this is what our, every pe uh, person has to know on a education system, I don't know if, if you meant it like that, but uh, like then when Germany says like oh everybody has to learn this, uh, and they basically can say uh, this, and then uh, you have to get to this certification level. No, I, I meant it exactly the other way around. Not what you have to learn, but the the the, the certification, right? To see if you have some education, if you know engineering well enough, if you know ar architecture well enough to build a house, right? This certification level has a very strong network effect. So the more universal it's agreed upon a, a, a certain test or a certain certification, the better. The level on how you get to that shouldn't be mandated at all, right? There should be just mm. free market wow. providers. And over time, you find out how this is very reputable. This is the best one. Then technology changes and the old 
frontal uh, university lectures don't work anymore, but the internet has much better processes than somebody out competes them. That, that shouldn't be regulated at all. But the certifications need to be as centralized as possible to just make them worthwhile, right? Because um, if everybody agrees, this is the test for an electrical engineer globally. I mean, it won't happen, but if it's there maybe just two or three tests, then it's easy, right? You you pass that test and you every company in the globe can just say, oh, he has passed that test. I'm looking for an engineer. So um, I look at that person because he has passed the test. So mm -hmm. that's that's something that, that's really um, something that gets more valuable the more it is centralized. So if there is market competition, I think it will maybe get two or three big certification agencies in the future uh, on a global scale where you just get your degrees from. But how you get to that degree, I think will be um, dependent on the market competition. But I want to go back to something you said, right? You said it's it's bad if that's decided centrally. I think the real problem because something is bad when it's decided centrally is not because a central committee made that decision necessarily, but because you just have to accept that, right? That's that's the whole issue, the monopoly. You have to pack your stuff, sell your property, move to another country if you don't don't agree with any central decision. And that's, I think, exactly backwards. If you don't agree with a central decision to the point where you say, I don't want to be part of this nation anymore, you have to be able to switch your nation, switch your property over to that nation Uh, without having to move, right? That's really the issue why we don't have a very uh, very good market competition between nations or, or between states because you're just basically forced. This is the structure and you have no way to get out of it. And I think uh, the internet, Bitcoin and all those developments we see uh, help get get to that uh, vision and that future faster and I uh, definitely hope that uh, there's more competition to those states because every time I mean probably you have the same experience every time I interact with governments or at government agencies uh, it's inefficient like like when we just leave out the 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 what what they are doing but just the things that you have to interact with them uh, it's really inefficient and whenever you interact with uh, like a company that has to compete in the free market it's usually like there are exceptions usually really efficient they answer you fast because they know if you don't uh, if, if they don't do a good job you will just switch to another one and that's yeah i mean i think in the end it com comes really down to ownership who owns you right who owns your life your body because right now you have to basically you're like a slave you cannot get out you can maybe get sold to another or ask to be allowed to have another owner but you're never really allowed to be actually free and for me communism for example is not the problem if i say my town um is a, a, a free town and we we trade completely freely, no regulations, and cap. And our neighbor town wants to be a communist town. Sure, let's do it. You can do it. But there's one rule. If any of your members want to become part of our town, wants to play by our rules and not by yours, you have to allow them. That's that's the only rule. You can do communism, you can do dictatorship, you can do whatever you want in your territory as long as all the people there Are, are good with it as soon as the people want to leave you have to le let them leave yeah definitely um let's switch back to bitcoin and uh, i often ask myself that like when we see all the bitcoin books all the bitcoin educational um, um content out there uh, it's pretty clear for me that like if you want to understand bitcoin you can understand it in a week or two weeks uh, fundamentally Uh, yes. You have to uh, you you have to break some barriers maybe that uh, pre uh, in in your mind already. Uh, you have to study like it's it's not something that comes natural to you uh, if you are in the fiat system for a long time. But what's holding Bitcoin back? Is the pain not big enough? Uh, do we have to do a better job in educa educating? Like why are we not at full scale mass adoption? Is it just Is it just a time that needs to be? Uh... There, there's, there's several points I think that I need to address. One is, I mean, I, I would separate understanding Bitcoin, the network, the technology behind it, and understanding money. Right? That's two completely different things. And you need to have both to really understand 
Bitcoin as uh, a concept. And, and that's what many people struggle, right? If you just have one of the two, then you're you're not really getting it. And then every technology, every disruption has this adoption curve. And basically what we know is every really disruptive um, technology, once it reaches 10%, in a decade, it goes to 80, 90%. The thing is that flat part of the curve until it really goes vertical can be really, really long. This can be for some technologies a year or a few years, like for the iPhone, for other technologies like 3D printing, <laughs> decades and decades and decades, right? And um, you, you don't really know when, when that part happens. I think we are pretty close to it with Bitcoin, but we're not there yet. And then you have to think separate... Um, there's several aspects of Bitcoin adoption, right? Store of value, medium of exchange, etc. I think Lightning payments will get adopted quicker than, than Bitcoin actually as your daily money because Lightning is just so superior to the old encrusted SWIFT, SEPA, uh, um, Visa, MasterCard systems um, that I think in a, a decade or one and a half decades, likely 90 plus percent of all transactions will be made over Lightning but these transactions may still be sending dollar to um, Turkish lira or something. So I, I think Lightning really is the Trojan horse that pushes uh, the adoption of Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin itself, until it really gets gets dominant, I think will take a few decades. And I think the it will have to face its real um, enemy, right? The real nemesis of Bitcoin is not fiat money. It, it's gold. <laughs> or re rather the, the silver gold bimetallic standard. And if that comes not back, I think it will get, be much quicker because fiat will just collapse in, in the 2030s. I'm 90% sure of that, that, that the dollar system will collapse. But I'm pretty sure that there will be some large um, state or, or league of states that will try the gold standard. And that is then really the long face off, right? Several decades to a century when when the old gold bimetallic standard competes with, with Bitcoin. So really the, the adoption speed, I think, depends on if that's if I'm if I'm right, if that standard comes back to compete with Bitcoin. If it doesn't come back, then I think it's over in a, in a couple of decades. The gold standard, but can only work in uh, as you said, in, in a digital area where you have something on top of gold. Right, it's like uh, in, I think yeah. uh, it will be really hard to convince people to actually pay directly with gold in a digital era. No, you always have gold certificates, but that's also yeah. why um, states prefer going back to a gold standard than to going to a Bitcoin standard, right? Because in the in the gold standard, the mo large portions of the gold are still in the vault. You still can have a national currency. You can still dilute it. You just have to be honest enough, right? The first few decades until you have outcompeted Bitcoin, you can try to have zero point something percent inflation try maybe even lower inflation than bitcoin has in the current halving so you, you can actually challenge it um i don't think it can win in the long run just precisely because in the end somebody gets greedy again prints too much um so i i think bitcoin is just simply the better monetary technology because you can actually with just 12 or 24 words can hold your Bitcoin and you know these are there. You can verify yourself that these are real Bitcoin, that they're actually there with very cheap technology. And on the other hand, with a network like Lightning, I mean, Lightning, it, it's a few years old. And I think people um, people really don't understand how disruptive Lightning is. People are like, oh, we need another layer too. Lightning has this and this trade off. But just think about it. Bitcoin was a revolution because for the first time in history, we solved the problem how to actually keep the monetary units in our currency constant, right? 3,000 years ago, the Greek philosophers knew and argued why the best money is one with a constant amount. But until uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, nobody figured out a technological way to keep it at that. The best technology was gold because they're just it's hard to mine more gold. That, that was the solution. And... On top of this revolution, we built Lightning. And Lightning is the first payment system in the world that can actually verifiably transact for very low fees instantly a full reserve money, right? With gold, this was not possible. If you, ha if you had to transact instantly around the globe, this was always like an IOU. 
it is not possible to instantly transact gold. And th it's, this is this is a whole additional layer on top because as I said, just even if you send gold certificates around the world, the the best way to do it is via lightning. Yeah, well, the, for, for me, I'm always really bullish on on the main layer, and I'm always really like uh, the main layer is, is 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 the most important, and of course, there will be the the scalabilities and the more technologies on top of that, uh, and there's so much going on uh, with like Lightning, Fediment, Liquid uh, stacks that there's there's a lot of of layer two uh, um, uh, solutions for in in the moment. For me, it's also like a Lightning should be the 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 one that that wins it's the one that most of of the people use will it be the the as you said the only one that uh, will be on top of bitcoin or is there still uh, like a a moment where it could be something else also i mean i think there's use cases for other layer twos or even layer three technologies built up upon uh, lightning But I think for just payments, actually transferring assets from A to B, um, Lightning is just so mind-bogglingly revolutionary and good. And I don't really see how to improve it because in the end, layer one had very deliberate trade-offs. And these trade-offs were to really make it the most solid foundation possible. But Lightning also maximizes trade-offs. It has different trade-offs, but it maximizes the trade-offs to be the best payment network possible. So um, if you want to have a better payment network than Lightning, I don't think that's possible because in the end you have to either um, have less security of actually having no uh, fractional reserve or you have to do another trade-off. The world's not a, not a fairy tale. You, you cannot just say, I want to max it all. You always have to trade off. And, and Bitcoin maximizes really security uh, Uh, of basically the one thing Bitcoin maximizes is the security that you will always have this free uninflatable base money. And that's the trade-off in, in L1. In Lightning, the trade-off is to have full reserve, keep that full reserve that's that's anchored in 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 uh in, in L1 with maximum uh, achievable uh security and then make that as easily and cheaply transactable around the globe. So every other layer two, I think would need to take compromises for its use case, but it would be a different use case. If you try to just build a better lightning, I don't think that's possible, right? And and also I think it's nonsensical trying to build another lightning. Yeah, you can do it, but I think the best way is to just improve lightning. Definitely. Um, let's switch a little bit of gears. I saw on your website uh, a dire warning to real estate investors. I did not uh, read it. I just saw it before the podcast. Uh, yes. But um, I had a podcast, I think, a few weeks back where we talked about how uh, Bitcoin will combat uh, homelessness because uh, it will drive down in the long run uh, the home uh, the the real estate prices is it about that like what should I mean, uh, really part of the prediction has already turned out true right i mean in with regulation the 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 home market in the eu and the germany specifically is already dead right um i myself sold all my uh, investing properties that i had i Could have waited one or two years longer to really hit the top, but I, I saw it coming and, and, and it happened. And right now, I only own the house I live in. And even that's not a economical decision, but rather a sentimental one, right? Mm. Um, the long-term play is that essentially real estate um, is just purely monetized, right? Real estate is the one where most of the cantillion effect goes because banks, retirement funds, the one thing they can buy is real estate. So um, if 10 new monetary units are created, I would say that probably eight or nine of them go into real estate. But at the same time, right, population is aging. Um, we will top out likely in a decade or two if nothing changes in birth rates and then even decline in population. So... Um, Real estate is really not a good case. It's leveraged to the hilt and um, the very tight demand and supply situation, I think, is also resolving. Also, 
I mean, just generally, there's so much open space and it's just artificially limited. For example, I, I live near the Austrian border near, near Salzburg and on the Austrian side, um, outside of the core city of Salzburg, real estate prices are cheaper than on, on the German side, just because there it's easier to just buy, buy a field and turn it into uh, building land. And here, in, in Bavaria, they made it by law almost impossible to build outside of existing city uh, or town boundaries. So um, a lot of this is just completely artificial inflation. For example, Munich, one of the most expensive cities uh, to live in in, in, in in Europe and definitely in Germany. But that city has a lot of space. You drive like half an hour outside and you're basically in the middle of nowhere where there's nothing. So the city could easily grow, easily. It's just not allowed to by law but as soon as the pressure builds high enough and these law change immediately people can build and value of of the houses especially in the on, on the outskirts of town um, will probably collapse yeah and the big part as you also mentioned is the monetary premium the like i think i don't know in germany it's also i think you know it's also in germany like that but in austria this mindset of I want to own my own house for retirement. I want to own my house for investment stuff. Uh, I think long-term people will see, uh, oh, it's better to have it actually in Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, people don't like to monetize stuff, right? M money has the strongest network effects of all human tools. It's really advantageous to have just one money. So, um, besides, of, of course, some kind of speculation, like in founding a company or something, um, in a hard money standard, there's very, very little monetary premium to all other goods besides the dominant money. And if you think it through, I mean, what do you think an ounce of gold will be worth if it's really only used for like um, de decorative purposes or industrial purposes? Likely, uh, you, you'll get a kilo of, of, of gold for what now an ounce costs. So the only question is, will Bitcoin win out? If yes, then it will definitely demonetize uh, the, the monetary premiums of most other goods. Maybe not completely, but at least uh, to 90 something percent. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm always curious before we get to the end routine uh, of our podcast, uh, what uh, guests are currently studying like, because we, uh, like most of my guests uh, fell down the rabbit hole a few years back or like not that recently. And at some point you are going down different rabbit holes, sometimes connected with Bitcoin, sometimes don't connect it at all with Bitcoin. Uh, like what's the, that's the current thing of you that you are now uh, really passionate about uh, right now studying about, is it Bitcoin? Is it that, but it, or is it something different? I mean, I'm of course passionate about building on Bitcoin, but really intellectually what I'm most going down is the oldest rabbit hole for me, far before Bitcoin. I was always interested in moral philosophy, right? How to structure a society. Are there objective morals? What part of morals is objective or subjective? And I'm, I'm, I'm really digging down into that, right? Bitcoin Nation was one part of that, but I really refrain from going too much into predicting how society will look. And right now, for me, I'm really going into thinking all this moral philosophy through um, reading some of the old um, Greek and Roman philosophers, reading Hoppe, of course, and, and especially trying to figure out where are they wrong? Because the, it's very, very difficult to talk about moral philosophy because the, the human default is to justify whatever you're doing, right? So your standard uh, moral um, way is... You have this set of morals that were basically indoctrinated into you as a child and that you gathered yourself and that basically, and also what you're doing, even if you're a mass murderer, you will justify, you find a reason why, why it was justified that you did that, right? So essentially moral reasoning by default is always, I do X and I find uh, arguments to justify X as good. And I'm really trying to work around my own biases, right? And to, to, to see the biases of a Rothbard, of a Hopper, and to try, okay, if I remove that bias that I see, how does it change the whole uh, framework of their argumentation? 
Yeah, definitely. It's, it, that's that's something uh, really, really cool. Uh, I like those kind of questions because um, I think uh, even as Bitcoiners, we should sometimes get out and uh, learn something different that uh, that's not about Bitcoin. Um, and uh, we're having an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And uh, your question from the previous guest is, uh, an interesting one. Uh, I think uh, it's 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 not not that easy to to answer. Uh, how much does it cost to produce a Bitcoin, and is that actually important in the in understanding Bitcoin and the price? I don't think it costs anything at all to produce a Bitcoin because essentially, um, or rather, the the cost that Satoshi would have put on his time to write the the white paper in version one dot zero of the code, because basically at that time. All the bitcoins were there. The, the The question from my perspective is really, what does it cost to acquire a bitcoin? <laughs> and um, that depends, right? How do you acquire it? Do you work for it? Do you mine it? Do you purchase it with fiat money? So I I, I think it's it's um, not yet an answerable question, especially since I think bitcoin is still too young and a lot too much is on 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 exchanges where there's paper bitcoin. Um, I think there's no market clearing price for Bitcoin yet, right? It's it, it's not found. Uh, the market has not um, honed in on 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 the on the market price of Bitcoin yet, really. Oh, it was a pleasure talking with you, Michael. Uh, it was uh, cool to have you, and I like your stance on Bitcoin nations. I hope we get to that future. Honestly, <laughs> it's me too. Future. Yeah, thanks for I, having I, me. I, I would love to see. And yeah, um, uh, before we uh, let you off, uh, where can people ask you questions? Where can people reach you the best way to ask you questions? I mean, there, there's my website, michaelantonfisher.com. Um, and there's also a contact form, I think. And yeah, um, the, the, the rest of the links, I think I'll just give you for the show notes. It's easier. Perfect. But just yeah. my, my, my name, no spaces, no dashes, edda.com and you find me. Perfect. Then thank you for being on. Thank you.